Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. I'd like to welcome Sandra White, MSP, uh, to the committee and Pauline McNeill, MSP, uh, to the meeting. Uh, since this is your first meeting with us, Pauline, do you have any relevant interest to declare? I don't. Thank you very much. Our first item on the agenda today is an evidence session with representatives from the Glasgow School of Art. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting Muriel Gray, the Chair of the Board of Governors, Professor Irene McCara McWilliam, uh, Deputy Director for Innovation at the Art School, and Liz Davidson, the Senior Project Manager of the Macintosh Building Restoration. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr Gray to make a short opening statement. Thank you very much, convener, and thank you very much, committee. Uh, so no need to introduce my colleagues since you've done so uh, so eloquently. Um, can I just thank you all, uh, convener and committee, for this opportunity. It's been incredibly useful because all the questions that you've rightfully been asking actually have run completely in parallel with the audit that you would expect us to be doing. So um, this is really helpful. Thank you. So. Thank you, and it's a great opportunity for us to speak about the Glasgow School of Art and our Macintosh building and our commitment to it uh, and our approach to its management and its conservation and restoration and now, of course, the rebuild, but also uh, to the significant and the very important contribution both the Glasgow School of Art and the Macintosh building make to Glasgow's and indeed Scotland's national cultural identity and creative impact. Uh, because we're without doubt experiencing uh, one of the most difficult periods in our school's proud history. But despite that challenge, we really are continuing to meet our responsibilities to our staff and our students uh, and meet their educational needs. And also, of course, to Scotland by delivering on our commitments that are detailed in our Scottish Funding Council Outcome Agreement. We are fully aware of the disruption and the impact on our local community and I particularly want to express our deep gratitude to our neighbours, the residents and businesses for their long-standing understanding, patience and continuing dialogue which is ongoing. We're also, of course, extremely grateful to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, to Police Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland, Glasgow City Council for all their professionalism and support. Um, there has always been significant public interest in the Macintosh building, so it's understandable, obviously, that people want to know what happened and, importantly, uh, what's going to happen next. But the widespread rumours and speculation following the fire in June are also totally understandable following the 2014 fire. Uh, and I can assure the convener and the committee that there's absolutely nobody wants answers more than we do. What we do know is that the cause of the 2014 fire was accidental, but we, like absolutely everybody else, do not know the cause of the second fire. And speculation about this really isn't being that helpful or supportive to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's ongoing investigation. However, what we do know is that we took every step possible above and beyond the standard in specifying the contract terms, including fire precautions for the Macintosh Building Restoration Project. So far from complacently standing back, we maintained day-to-day -day supervision of the project works, both on-site and off-site. Um, the tragedy is, of course, uh, that just before this fire, uh, the contractor was doing an absolutely stunning and beautiful job and the project was on time and on budget. And it, we had just been about to return for our staff and our students and importantly for the people of Glasgow, not one of just the world's most important buildings, but one of the most seminal buildings which to study art and design and architecture for everyone to visit and to be part of. And we recognise the interest and the concern of the wider community, both across Scotland and beyond, as to what happens next, and particularly the interest of this committee uh, in that question. Uh, the board and the staff are completely clear about the importance of the Macintosh building to the educational experience of our students and to its contribution to the global position of Glasgow and Scotland's cultural and creative identity, which is so important. Um, now, this is a position that has been reinforced, as you know, by many of the contributors uh, to this committee's discussions, which has been very helpful. Um, 
Glasgow School of Art, therefore, is clear and very strong in its resolve to restore the Macintosh building to its rightful place at the centre of our education um, and to the city as an open and accessible working school of art. And as custodians of the Macintosh building, I'm sure you can see that's why we do not apologise for telling you over and over again that determination and that commitment. So a written submission, which we hope you've all got, we think is uh, as comprehensive and detailed as we can with the um, accompanying documents. Uh, absolutely delighted to answer any questions arising from those, or indeed if there's any appendices that you feel are missing, we can also supply those later on. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Dr Gray, and can I take this opportunity to thank you for coming today and also to thank you for your extensive uh, written submission, which has certainly kept us all busy over the last few days. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, can, can I start by... Um, in your submission on page 13, uh, you say we have always taken fire precautions seriously across our whole estate. Now, in the course of um, our, our evidence gathering, our committee has heard from Alexandra Kidd, who is an independent uh, fire safety expert who chaired the UK Working Group on Protecting Historic Buildings. Now, he said that he visited the art school with Historic Scotland in 1997, and at that time, uh, comments were made and discussions were had around the, the voids, uh, the ventilation ducts that Macintosh had desi designed. And, of course, we know that in 2014, the fire report said that these ventilation ducts and other voids were the reason why the fire accelerated. So they were identified in 1997. Uh, your own report, um, the federal report, which the Glasgow School of Art commissioned in 2006, also identified uh, these ventilation ducts uh, as a as a serious hazard, and that and that report said that the art school was at high risk of fire uh, spreading. Now that was uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, and when we heard from your architects two weeks ago, they told us that these ducts still hadn't been blocked at the time of the 2018 fire. Why was that? Um, well, can you, with your permission, can I pass that over to Liz Davidson, who's the expert on voids? <laughs> I've become an expert <laughs> on voids, even more so, I think. Um, you're quite correct if we go back to, I think, Stuart Kidd, um, his report from his submission yes, to the... Alexander to the, Stewart, I believe. Yeah. All oh, right, sorry. Okay. I've got, no, sorry. Right. My, I think my he error. uses both names. Ah, OK, fine. Um, his report talks about the federal report. You're quite correct. The, the, the ducts that um, are the voids, whichever, that he talks about were in the building from the start, obviously, it was part of Macintosh's system for bringing air through the building and for taking services up through the building. So it wasn't that they were known about from 1993 or 97 or, or earlier or later. They, they were always there and always um, part of this building. Um, the federal report is, is effectively our response at the time to a whole series of things uh, in the building to upgrade the building's fire safety at that point. So in 2006, the initial report was commissioned from Bureau Happel, Services Engineers. The report you referred to in 2008 was the result of that. And what it pointed out was quite clear, clearly, I think, in, in the conclusions to that report, that as with pretty well any historic building of certainly Victorian and Edwardian era, well, you had services. If you go back much earlier, you don't have you know, pipes running and taking electricity or whatever. Um, the building was full of cavities, voids, what they call standoffs. Um, I think in his in his report, in his writing extensively in, in for Historic Scotland, actually, he did talk about the fact this is part of how the building operates and breathes and talks about how you actually use these voids in a building to take services and ride us, rise us through it. Even today, that would be the practice Historic Environment Scotland would approve. So, yes, these areas within the building, which were not just risers, were not just ducts, but were cavities behind lath and plaster, behind panelling, were known about. The response to that from the school or taking the advice of Bureau Happel, the advisors and experts at the time were to actually fire, install a fully engineered fire system. So it wasn't just clog the building up, close all the cavities. We yeah. didn't even can, know. Can I just those. interrupt you there? I'm sorry, because in that report, it said that, you know, it, in the, you made a decision not to fire stop the voids. And they say in the report, this is not their recommendations, they say the client requirements are that a major intervention in the building fabric to create compartmentation uh, would be extremely uh, unlikely to be authorised. So for co I, I'm assuming we, for conservation reasons, you, you didn't want to block these ducts because mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what uh, 
at what the architects we, Page and Park said um, yes. in relation to 2018 that I, it was a conservation project and that was another reason why they didn't block fire stop them? The Fed report wasn't a conservation project at all. It was all about the safety of the building. There was no instruction from Glasgow School of Art to not stop voids. In fact, some of them were stopped after that report and even before that report. So there are over 130 ducts. There are many, many more voids in the building that we didn't even know about until, in fact, after the, the fire in 2014 when it revealed areas of the building we didn't know even had these voids. Um, so there was no instruction from Glasgow School of Art not to do it. In fact, the instruction was as part of a fully engineered fire system, these are areas that would be stopped or dampened or partially uh, automatically stopped as and when. The voids are, there are multifarious kinds of voids, but the two main ones in the building and what was uh, involved in 214 or part of what was involved in 214 was the fact we had timber risers that took services up the building. That's totally common. You'll have risers in this building and any building. Um, those voids were uh, and are still serving that building. They're taking, uh, but what we are installing, we have stopped some, we have put dampers through uh, others, we have automatic closers on others. You can't stop the building immediately. You have to do it when you're putting in the, the work itself. So that was happening after 2.14. Some had happened previous to 2.14 as well. So some of the redundant ones already been stopped. As I say, others weren't known about, but that was part of the federal report was to actually put in a fully engineered system, which is to say you can't close up every void, especially ones you don't know about. So what you do is you put in, amongst other things, uh, a missuppression system was what the school then embarked mm. on um, in fundraising and putting in store, putting into the building on the eve of the 2.14 fire. Sadly, okay. it wasn't completed. On the fire suppression system, again, so we, we didn't stop the voids because they caused the 2014 fire and they hadn't been stopped by... 2018 uh, but the going back to the federal report uh, you you said that you you chose a fire suppression system at that time again it's a long time ago why did it take so long because in both the 2014 and the 2018 fire the fire suppression system hadn't been installed well d just sorry just to c um, come back on one thing there the voids in 2014 didn't cause the fire the, the Scottish fire and rescue report Actually, it was very clear yeah, that they it, was accelerated a, it, was a, it. Well, it was a yeah. it was an accident, it, and and uh, the cause was a projector and expanding foam. So, I suppose technically, if that had happened in the middle of the room, you know, that we would still have had uh, if I, to to go to the second part of. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, I think school, we have to be clear here that that fire report, and I've read it several times, is very clear about the importance of these voids, which acted like chimneys and had been left unstopped. The fact that it occurred at the base of a void, and it was one of the rises that hadn't been stopped as opposed to one that had been stopped, definitely took the building vertically up the building instead of horizontally at that yeah. point, and it, it moved in a different okay. way. Uh, we don't know what caused the fire this time, of course, because we haven't had the report yet, so the voids may have had no role in, in this at all. Um, the t question you asked about the timing, I think, was answered in Page and Park's report, but in 2008 we had the report that uh, this was the recommendation from experts was to put in, very unusually, and most historic buildings, most public buildings will not have any kind of fire suppression system in them still. Uh, but Glasgow School of Art decided to take that step, unusual amongst uh, probably most university campuses, I would say, in Scotland, to put that in. The first thing we had to do was to fundraise, and that was something like two and a half years of fundraising to achieve that once we have a system, then to design it, and then to get statutory approval, as you say, from both our own city council and their listed building department and Historic Environment Scotland. I think the tender was let within a month of the listed building consent being approved and the contractor on site shortly after that. In, in terms of the fundraising, at, at that time, you uh, spent £50 million on campus development, including the, the new Reed building. People will wonder why you couldn't afford a fire suppression system immediately after this ha report showing that the building was high risk when you spent £50 million building the Reed building. I won't talk about well, the Reed. No, I, I, uh, this is obviously before our uh, our time, so we just have to to go on the historic facts that that we know. But um, it was a major uh, concern of the, the governing body and the management at that time, which is, uh, I believe that the we were not eligible for um, heritage lottery funding at that time because only for repairs. Is that correct? Sorry, Scotland. Scotland. Um, so. Uh, 
and it wasn't necessary either, even though it was that. So we were doing it as a built, or the, the school was doing it as a belt and braces approach, um, and the fundraising was successful. And it was as Liz has said, it was in the process of being fitted before the 2014 fire. You and you, you all say the committee know why it had been halted. It was because asbestos had been found in the opening, so it was only temporarily halted. Yes, but you said it was a very complex system. Actually, sprinkler systems, I mean, according to Historic Scotland's own own uh, documents, advisory documents on historic buildings, sprinkler systems are quite common in historic buildings, but you ruled out a sprinkler system um, in favour of a mis-suppression system. No, Why was that? Can I well, answer that and I'll let Liz back me up on that. We, we weren't permitted to use a standard sprinkler system because it being a grade A listed building, it contained Macintosh artefacts and things that would have been destroyed by water. So that's why we were refused permission to put in a normal uh, uh, standard sprinkler system. So the only other alternative was a mis-suppression system which was uh, a relatively new but that was the, the best one and that was approved by Historic Environment Scotland as being safe to use so if someone sets off a toaster uh, you don't ruin half of your uh, who, heritage. Sorry, who, who didn't give you permission for the sprinkler system? Historic Environment Scotland. Right. It's just because in the, the original federal report you rule out the sprinkler system uh, on the grounds of aesthetics um, because of the large pipe works and so on, and you 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 favour the mist suppression system because it, you say it's less intrusive, it's got smaller nozzles and things like that. that that's an issue, but it was also but that, more to do with protection. That was before you had to ask permission. You you had decided on the mist suppression system, which didn't have a British standard at that time. It it had it was untried. It was untried. Sorry. Can I remind the the committee of one thing that. Glasgow School of Art, the Macintosh building, was a fully compliant building at the time of the first accidental fire in 2014. If it hadn't been compliant already with every fire safety regulation in the land, we wouldn't have been able to have students in it. So the, it wasn't a building that was inherently dangerous in, or too dangerous to occupy. It was already met every standard. We had fire alarms. We had every fire extinguisher. It already met it. Otherwise, nobody could have gone through the door. As, as Muriel says, actually, this is it was a belt and braces approach, and actually, not many buildings are sprinklers. Um, if you look at university campuses, we would probably both with the reed, the stove when it comes on on um, a stream, and also the mac when it would have come back and will come back, is probably about seventy percent of our estate. I would challenge, uh, you know, a survey of states around Scotland of academia or of any other good historic public building to see more than about five or ten percent of it. So GSA is going way beyond. I understand your point about the sprinkler as opposed to misoppression. The Lucid Bill Consent is concerned about aesthetics. That is, it's not to make it sound a, a, a frippery. LBC is about affecting the character of a listed building. So Historic Environment Scotland or our own Building Control Department, our own um, Conservation Department, would have been concerned about how much damage was yeah. being done to the building by but taking you, through you, large You pipes. had decided on this system, which for wasn't British Standard approved at an early, at an early stage, before asking for permission. It's, it wasn't that it had approvals, because it is in use, otherwise it, w it yeah. was more, at that point, certainly a marine environment it was used in. It has full compliance, and it wasn't it a wasn't standard system. It wasn't compliant at that time. It, it says been. in your it says in your report that that was one of the problems with them with it that was its downside it wasn't compliant there weren't that many people who were qualified to install it um, and you know, it didn't have it didn't have a standard it is a compliant system it is a kit of parts so as we know from very long uh, discussions with both makers in Denmark in our case um, and FM approvals uh, BS. BA approvals, we had a compliance system that would have been put in, otherwise we wouldn't have had a building warrant front. We couldn't have put in a system that didn't meet compliance. But it has yeah. possibly around 24, two dozen, three dozen different types of between heads, pipes, valves, pumps. You have right. to put the whole system together and that becomes the compliance system. The system that was being put into the Macintosh was an extraordinarily bespoke system because of the extraordinarily bespoke nature of the building and it was to protect its aesthetics. But also very importantly, and I think it is in our report, we didn't have the water to put in a sprinkler system. A sprinkler system uses about a tank size that would have drained down Garnet Hill. So we didn't. We were not allowed from Scottish Water, and we had that in writing, that we connect, couldn't connect to what we call the town mains. If we'd done so, well, they wouldn't have allowed that connection. We had to provide a tank in the building. The only way to have done that under a sprinkler system would have taken out almost half the first floor and put in a swimming pool. Um, 
However, what we had to do was make one work with the available water that we were... In fact, in this scheme, what we had to do was excavate down quite deeply into the founds of the Macintosh to achieve a tank that would make even a mist suppression system which uses much less water. So we didn't have the option of using a sprinkler system. It would have been, we didn't have the water reserve to do so. Okay. You ruled out a sprinkler system for the store building as well, didn't you? No, a sprinkler system's being put into the yeah, store building as we speak. you did rule it speak. out initially, didn't you? Uh, no, I can answer that from the government's point of view. We didn't rule it out. We had to examine it because part of our job as governors is to be fiscally prudent as well as safety. So we had a look at uh, what the store building would mean in terms of compliance. It would have been fully compliant, again, for fire safety without a sprinkler system. So we looked at that, but the extra cost of putting a, a sprinkler system, I think, came in about £1.3 million. Um, and after some discussion, we decided that we would put it in. Right. It's just in your board papers it says you decided to put it in after the um, the Grenfell fire. You changed your mind. It says uh, that in your board papers. Yeah, no, no, I cross this completely there. Yeah. Uh, we had many discussions and then we had discussions pre-Grenfell as well. And after Grenfell, we had decided that that was going to be the safest yeah. course just, forward. <clears throat> yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't a handbrake turn. OK, thank you very much. Mm. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, we've had a number of panels in front of us about Glasgow Art School and um, we have also received a number of emails from interested parties. It's fair to say there's a degree of conflict and claims and counterclaims around. Now, it's difficult for us, part of our job here, to determine and try and make some judgment on some of the factors that have been involved in, in the two fires. Why do you think there's this level of uh, conflict and that the committee are hearing different versions of what happened. Why do you think it's an issue with culture of the college? And it's what added into that is the recent resignation of the director. It would, from the outside, appear that it's not a particularly happy ship at, at the moment. Why, why do you think we're receiving these kind of... Why do you think we're in this situation? I, I, I can't um, answer that, I'm afraid. Uh, I think these are minority views. Um, We've had the opposite. We've had many emails and letters and uh, personal messages of support. We are collegiate and strong, and there are a number of individuals I know that have uh, voiced their own opinion and speculation. None of them are facts, though, as you can see from our, I think, quite comprehensive speculation uh, uh, submission. Um, I can't answer that. I don't know what the issue is with the, the emails. I don't know which ones you're referring to. I think anything that's been presented as evidence to the committee has been answered in our submission, but personal things online, I don't know. It's All I can say is it's an extremely happy place right now, and I can assure the committee that, in fact, it's a great opportunity to thank the astonishing staff management, the directorate uh, and the students and the board as well for five months of absolutely amazing hard work which they've done together with uh, great courage and comradeship so that's not the impression that we get. Is it possible to say a bit more about the resignation of Professor uh, Tom Inns? Um, yes I think he's resigned at quite a critical time we're now in a situation where we're having people move up to that role in temporary positions. So there's a question of our leadership at the college at a time where obviously you're facing a very difficult situation. Yes, well, let me completely reassure the committee there isn't a problem of leadership just now because we have Professor uh, McCarmick Williams, who's one deputy director, and Professor Ken Neal, who's our other deputy director, have stepped up into that post um, and are running the art school very beautifully. And um, this Monday, of course, all the students went back into the accommodation that was pre-2015 uh, pre fire. Uh, sorry, uh, 15th of June. Um, it's all back running fine. Um, I can't say very much about Professor Inns' resignation other than the statement that he's made to the public and our response to it. We've thanked him very much because I cannot think of a principal who's had to deal with a tenure as difficult as Professor Inns had, you know, two major disasters within five years. And he has uh, left us at a time when everything has been put back into place after five months of extremely hard work, um, for which we're very grateful and have said so publicly. 
Um, OK, can I ask some questions around the fire safety plan? So we took sure. evidence from the contractors mm -hmm. um, around this. Part of the evidence said that the fire safety plan was dynamic and required signing off at multiple stages and with a fluid document. Now, we've seen some of the reports, and it's in your own evidence you've submitted, submitted to us, about visits and various other events that happened and mm -hmm. staff moving in and out of the building and offices changing. What would be... Do you want to explain a bit more how how the document was dynamic. Are those the kind of factors that would change the document and how much involvement did the board have on oversight of this? Uh, the board had, had a lot of oversight of this, but again, that's before you can see the minutes from the various committees. We had a Macintosh Restoration Committee and that reported directly into the board. Um, Liz and her team were, of course, on site and she can speak a little bit more about that, about the visits particularly. Um, but I can assure the committee absolutely 100% that visiting the MAC site, which was a construction site, was absolutely thoroughly, thoroughly uh, uh, procedural heavy. Uh, you, did, you did not get into the Macintosh without going through the absolute proper procedures, and that was ensured both by Keir and by the GSA. Uh, so so it would, wasn't would, that, sorry, would that be a factor that would then change the fire safety plan, or what would be the factors? Why would it be a dynamic document? What would be the... Uh, uh, Liz can explain that, but that's not... Sorry, yes, the, I suppose the main reason it would change, and it has to be a dynamic document, is um, if you recall after the first fire, we actually lost not just the library, but for instance, the roof of the entire east side of the building. Um, sorry, the west side of the building. Um, so obviously, you know, you had an open air structure at that point with, an, in fact, a canopied structure, a scaffolded roof over it. That got roofed, so eventually that would have been brought back in with uh, fire detectors underneath the, the new ceilings, et cetera, where we didn't have ceilings before. Things like that meant that they would review the fire plan and say, at this point now, we have a new fire stop in here, we have a new fire door because we now have a compartment, we now have a room. So it had to move along with that chain of events as the site progressed, really. And just finally, fr from myself, there's been discussion around uh, whether the art college prior to 2014 and whatever its future might be, whether that is a suitable building for a working modern art school. And if we look at the cause of the 2014 fire, whether it was appropriate that that type of creative activity was happening in that type of building, um, do you accept those, uh, or how do you feel about that debate? Do you accept those concerns? And the future plans, I know you're committed to uh, rest, well, rebuilding of the <coughs> art college. Is there and if, if that is the way we end up going, is there a consideration of what actually takes place in that building in terms of it operating as a working art school? Um, the, there's no debate from our point of view about it being a working art school. That's how it was designed. It's worked beautifully for 100 years as that. And I think... Well, it's, it's not, I don't mean to be rude or to interrupt, but it, it's worked beautifully. But the cause of the first fire was, I understand a student's work that um, has been appropriate for that type of work to happen in that type of building? No, it's completely appropriate for it to, to happen. What happened was the individual involved uh, did not follow instructions and had they followed instructions that type of work is completely appropriate and safe and has been for many years. The accident, as outlined in the SFRS uh, report shows it was a perfect storm of somebody not doing what they were inducted to and told to several times not to. The work had nothing to do with it. That kind of work has been going on for years in the art school. Uh, to answer your second point, um, there is no question at all that this building is a working part of the art school and in fact if you talk about our remit which is to deliver creative education the Macintosh building itself is more than a building it's actually a tool of learning for the students who who come to our school of art so you cannot separate it but there is an argument put forward um or there's been discussion around as we have the role of historic scotland it is more than an art school it's a building of significance to the whole of scotland so there are questions about whether the art school is the uh, two parts, whether it's the right body to go forward with the project and also whether it's the right activity to take place in that building. Um, 
But accept that's not a view that you share. It's no, I, I absolutely accept, disagree yeah. with your second view. Of course it is. It has to be a working art school. Uh, whether uh, the art school are the right people to be the custodians of it? Yes, absolutely. We've been very useful custodians. Um, you cannot separate the two. It will always be part of our academic plan. Uh, it will always be part of the DNA mm -hmm. of the art school. In fact, I'd pr probably like to bring Professor McCarroll in here about this. Um, and it's a major part of us connecting with the city. Um, it's not a museum, it's a beautiful, important, iconic building, but one of the reasons it's so important it is because it has been a working art school for this time. And I can testify to that because I was lucky enough to study in it. And, of course, a new rebuild will not have the pattern up that people like myself have built up over the last 100 years. But I tell you something, when all of us in this room are long gone, in another 100 years, it will have its own one. And it will be the same building, and it will have the same effect and the most wonderful, creative, inspirational ideas on the people who are lucky enough to study in it. I don't know if you'd like to say something, Professor. If I may, can, uh, may I add to that? Yeah, well, just there. quickly, because we've got quite a number of members who've got quite a lot of questions. So, Can I just ask for a bit? Yes, this okay. Is quite an important yes. part because the, the, the Macintosh being a learning tool is a really major part of what we're discussing today. Since the 2014 fire, we endeavoured to bring back the Macintosh in a way that would serve the educational needs of our students and our future students. And our intention was to house in that building all first years. So anybody coming to Glasgow, to Glasgow School of Art to study from Glasgow, from Scotland or internationally would be welcomed into the art school in the Macintosh building and would become extremely proficient in, the, in that particular legacy and would be able to take that with them as a cultural ambassador for Glasgow School of Art in Glasgow when they finish their studies. They would be immersed, as we all know, in a building of extreme significant beauty and function. And from the papers that have been supplied, it was noted that in the review of our estate, it was still the most functional building, not only the most aesthetically beautiful, talking to our creative industries and contributing to the creative economy. It was the most relevant building and will remain so. And therefore, why would we deny current and future generations of students uh, the ability to have the experience that is so deeply lodged in people's minds and is reflected in some of the statements that have been submitted to the committee. We are edu we're educators and we want high quality education and that's, that's what we're about. That's why we want to bring back the Macintosh to that very specific function that Charles Rennie Macintosh designed it for. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'd like to return to the convener's questions around the fire suppression system. Um, I understand completely how immensely complex it is to install a fire suppression system in, in a building of that kind. I'm a bit concerned around the, the financial decisions that, that were taken, so the need to, to fundraise for it. I wonder if you'd be able to explain why, for example, the, the SFC Museums Grant, which at that point in time was around 200 grand a year, couldn't be put towards it. There was a lottery grant uh, for conservation in, in 2008. Why were other f funds that were already being received by the School of Art not put into funding a fire suppression system as a matter of priority? Because it seems the delay required to raise additional funds created a delay that has unfortunately led to this because the suppression system wasn't ready. Um, well, I don't think that... I don't accept the premise of the question that it was the delay that led to the fire for a start, so I think that's, no, that's it, incorrect. No, it, it led to... It, the delay did not lead to the fire, but if no. the fire suppression system had been in place, it would not have been the fire it was, clearly. Um, but the fire, it would have been in place if we hadn't uncovered the asbestos, so your timing slightly wrong. No, I you mean, would have, going... if, to be clear, at the point you decided that there needed to be this fire suppression system, you then had to embark upon a fundraising campaign for it. Mm -hmm. If you had instead allocated funds you were already receiving, you would not have had to spend a couple of years fundraising. You could have immediately begun installing that system. You would have uh, discovered the asbestos, what, two years before you actually did? The fire suppression system would have been in place two years before this fire took place. And when the fire took place, in theory, the suppression system would have 
suppressed it. So why were funds that you were already receiving not prioritised for the suppression system? Um, I'm afraid I'm not able to ask that because um, I wasn't in office at that time, but from everything that we've read through the minutes and everything, there seemed to be uh, a very uh, cohesive and uh, sensible approach to that. That's all I can say. It was economics and it was, as Liz has pointed out, the, the building was completely safe. Um, this was a belt and braces approach that, uh, that was being put in by the previous administration to further ensure absolute top-notch five-star gold star standard fire protection, but it was already safe. Right. Could I also uh, add, I'm yeah. sorry, just, just on that, really. Uh, uh, you're quite correct. Those applications to funders which involved Historic Environment Scotland or Historic Scotland at the time, HLF and other funders, ERDF, had been made. It was for a conservation and access project. Um, I'm sure most members will know when you apply to anybody, public sector in particular, you can't then say, well, thanks for the money, we're going to spend it on something else. Even if you feel that that may be more important than what you've asked for the money for, it would have been Historic Environment Scotland were approached, they were asked, they have been amazing partners throughout the whole of the Macintosh conservation projects over three decades now, in fact, funding it. But they would not have been able, as I understand legally, to switch money for what they have by statute laid down to put into the repair and conservation of buildings and move it into misuppression systems. By, by dint of their remit, they repair, but they don't add to a building. So, um, And I think it probably, I'm not speaking just for HES, but for others, would open the floodgates particularly now, to a lot of applications for money from the public purse to put misoppression through thousands and thousands, your own properties in care, you know, all of these all of these buildings. So we couldn't switch the money once having made those, signed those contracts with those particularly public sector bodies. Yes, Mr. Mr. Reed, can I also um, add the, uh, the, the word here is enhancement. That, that was an enhancement to the building rather than a necessity. And that's, again, why I presume the administration at that time had to fundraise. I'm, I'm still not completely clear, particularly in the case of the, the SFC uh, regular museums grant, but I, I accept that if you were not in post at the time, then it would understandably be a difficult question to answer at the moment. In that case, I think the committee would benefit from a, a written response sure. uh, at some point in the no near future. Um, your um, board papers from uh, before uh, the 2018 fire refer to a dispute with the insurers uh, over the fire suppression system. Would you be able to detail to the committee what this dispute is? I don't, I'm not quite sure which one you're referring to, Mr Greer. Could you be more specific? It, it's in the, the uh, papers of a board meeting from before the fire. It mm -hmm. mentions, uh, now, I don't think it mentions any particular level of detail, which is why we're interested, but it mentions some kind of dispute, some kind of issue between the insurers and yourselves right. regarding the fire uh, suppression system. Right, casting far back into my board minutes. <laughs> Um, there was a point at which uh, this whole process has been incredibly uh, closely followed, to say the least, by our insurers, um, obviously particularly since 2014. But the school had more than one insurer. The main insurer at that time was Royal Sun Alliance, who behaved wonderfully after the first fire. But we also had another insurer, which was AXA Insurance, and that was for contents. And that mainly, um, we maintain still the archive of Glasgow School of Art within the Macintosh building. Um, and that required a different kind of system. So missuppression would still have involved water. A lot of museums, I think the National Library here, et cetera, will still have, uh, where you have areas where water is deemed to be a bigger risk than fire, uh, i.e. with paper mainly, you'd normally use a hypoxic system, which is to take the oxygen out of that area. Yeah. So there was a discussion between both areas of the insurers at that time and their specialist advisors about whether we went for an entirely wet system and a mist or one that zoned out the building. And in the end, we did decide, in fact, to go with the entire mist suppression system with a, with a, a low pressure mist system. But it was, yeah, it was, it was worth taking their advice and hearing it and then taking it back to our own um, uh, learning and teaching people as well and finding out what would be the best system. So is, is this what the insurer was then questioning this year, um, where, this year, why those decisions had been made in regard to what particular suppression system was used? Right, I don't, I don't know about the paper from this year, from after the 2018 fight, fire. Is yeah, so the, well, th this is from before the 2018 uh, fire, but it's uh, right. board papers from this year um, that mention this dispute. So I understand what you're saying yeah. around the Sorry. questions yeah. over which suppression system to use. Yeah. It's, uh, the question, therefore, then still stands, uh, what 
what was raising concerns with the insurer? Why why were they dispute? Might be the wrong word for it, though. I think that might be the the word in the minutes. I, I can't okay. quite recall. I don't think there there was there. any dispute at all with our insurers? It's been it's been mm. a very amicable uh, process so far. There's been discussions as as. Liz has pointed out between how, the how and the what and the wherefore, but the, I don't recall any dispute whatsoever with uh, insurers. We'll, we will check the papers course, yeah. and, and, and provide a written... If, you, if you can be very well. specific about the particular paper I'll, you're I'll referring to, and we will minutes, totally, yeah. totally back to you. Mm -hmm. Papers from October 2017. Mm -hmm. um, the committee noted the latest risk register. It would notice that the risk of programme delay resulting from uncertainty and confirmation of the fire suppression system had now receded, given the progress made in discussions with the contractor and the insurer. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would be quite surprised that you were still, you had only just settled this um, this disagreement with the insurer in October 2017, which I think it was well over a year after Kia yep. were awarded the contract. It wasn't a disagreement, convener. It was just an ongoing discussion, and our risk register is very thorough. That audit is very thorough about risk registers, so that was just merely the conclusion of those discussions. There wasn't any dispute. Okay. Thanks very much. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Can I just ask a couple of supplementaries, convener, to uh, Rosgrew's line of questioning, the first line of questioning there? Just so I understand this properly, um, the building after the first fire, obviously, ha there was a known vulnerability to fire. Would that be fair to say? Uh, in, in any building, there's always uh, well, yeah, vulnerability to fire. Yes, just the same as any other institution. No, that's. was there a greater vulnerability to fire? Let me just try to understand this building in particular. Mm. We all live in lots of buildings. Was there a greater vulnerability? Did you assess there to be a greater vulnerability to fire in this building? As because of the voids, because of the questions the convener was asking to start. Oh, right. I mean, in terms of lessons learned about the first yeah. fire, yes, of course, we knew absolutely everything about the building. In the previous years, we had not known. It was sure. a real forensic. No, that's so, fine. Entirely yeah, fair. absolutely. Entirely fair. That's yeah. entirely fair. So therefore, I think that's why it's interesting, Ross Gray's line of questioning. Uh, therefore, it wasn't it the first thing to be done in build in in the new in the construction thereafter the reconstruction thereafter to build in a fire su a fire suppression system a mist system wasn't that the first thing to be designed in um again the, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize Liz, you weren't there I, I know you weren't there no, no, but, but shouldn't um, that have been the absolutely number one thing to have done first uh, thing up so you mean between the 2014 mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and again uh, sorry to keep throwing this back at yes. our technical expert so, yeah. but of course it was uppermost in our minds uh, and 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 thus therefore <laughs> therefore, poor Liz has to answer the question. <laughs> Back to the expert yeah. the project. This has come up um, in a very interesting way, and I think this will have repercussions beyond the Macintosh, mm. beyond Scotland, actually, about um, on, in construction sites generally. Um, the issue of, uh, I think, one of the submissions, again, Mr. Kidd's submission in particular, I think, talks about this in detail about temporary. Uh, temporary or early commissioning of a fire suppression system mm. in a building. Um, we had experts on our uh, panel, Atelier 10, where our fire engineers, the commissioning of that mist suppression would have been the very first, it would have come on as soon it was, as it was there, but I, I really accept the question because the, the one thing I have been asked so many times since is exactly that. And what I am at pains to say to everybody is, it can't be commissioned until it's there. So the very first thing was to agree a design going forward. We had a different building altogether after the 214 fire. We didn't have, as I say, roofs in some areas. Um, we were able to see where voids existed where we didn't know they had existed because of the fire. But the, the putting in place of that suppression system was the first thing that would have been put on in terms of the building management. So the Joint Code of Practice, much referred to about prevention of, of fires and construction sites, um, is all about early commissioning as soon as possible, and it's absolutely right. So it's the first thing you do. You don't bother painting the wall or laying the carpet. If you've got the pipework in, the pump in, the tank in, and it's been pressure tested and it's ready to go, you put that on five months ahead. But of it didn't actually, just forgive my ignorance here, but it didn't actually happen, did it? It was Still probably, took two more 60, years, or? probably 60 percent completed, but no, we had the tanks on site and we had, well, we had the tank being excavated and that had completed and the pumps were on site. The pipework was probably 60 percent completed. It has to, the installation of the pipework um, has to follow the construction yeah, phase itself. I totally understand, so yeah. it was moving from west to east as where the fire had happened and moving into the active area. The active area of the site was very much in the west. Uh, it was moving east and into areas. So, so in that sense, your engineers didn't think there was anything more you could do. I mean, I know this is all in hindsight, but they didn't think in any way there was more that could be done to build in that system uh, as early in the process as possible. It was genuinely being built as it went along. So th those guys were working quite often after the main trades had finished. They couldn't work 
on the same platforms as painters or plasterers, but as soon as the room was finished, the misdepression was following in behind it. We'd come in on a Monday morning and that would have happened quite often because they would come in on weekends when the other wet trades or the dust trades or whatever had finished. So they were moving very closely behind and Kia were managing that very tightly. So we had a big team that were just moving as quickly as they could to move through the building as soon as the room was finished or a floor was finished or the compact meditation was in place, the misdepression would come in behind it. But it's a very large site. It's not like you can put in something into a, into a room would be fine, but this this was 7,500 feet of, of, of space that we had to fit out with the misdepression system, a sure, very yeah. complex system. In that case, I really don't understand what the problem was with money, because Roscoe's questions were about why there was a delay in putting the system in, uh, and his line of questioning was you could have spent money earlier. Let's not bother about where all the money comes from, but you could have spent money earlier. You're arguing that actually the system went in from day one as the building was reconstructed. Yeah, the difference to you is that the question on money, I may have misinterpreted, sorry, if so, is that pre the 214 when we had what looked on paper like four years between somebody recommending a misdepression system in the federal report to, to installing it uh, or not quite finishing the installation 214 was we genuinely had to fundraise there. Whereas after 214, we were working on the process of the insurance, uh, which was coming through and additional fundraising that we received from Scottish government and UK government as well. So it was one of the absolute um, keystones of the brief that went out to the contractor in 214 was that the misdepression system and a fully engineered fire system yeah. really would have been put into this in the building at, at the earliest possible point and commissioned as early as possible which is what the Joint Code of Practice recommends. And would it be fair to say I guess the Fire and Rescue Service are looking into that exactly that that'll be part of their assessment as to what actually happened. They, yes. They've not long since taken access but it is I'll something bet. that yeah. yeah. Okay thank you. Thank you. Gibson. Thank you very much, Kimby. I just want to switch to losses to the collection. Um, Roger uh, Billcliff and Stuart Robson, director of the Macintosh Society, had even said that uh, GSA failed to be open about the losses from the 2014 uh, fire and said that your uh, media release and blog focused on what had been saved and some losses rather than full extent of the losses. So it's just to see whether there's a comprehensive public accessible list available. There is, yes, absolutely, totally, and it was at the time, and it's completely accessible and online and in the public domain. OK, because um, we've been told that staff have privately said they were prohibited from speaking about the full extent of the losses. That's, That's com the case completely untrue. Right, and everything has been detailed. Can, um, can I ask you um, what the insurance payout was for the items lost and how will, how will this be spent? Because some of the items are obviously completely irreplaceable. Yes, they, they are completely irreplaceable. There were two separate insurance schemes at that point. One, of course, was for the building and one was for the contents. Um, so at the time... Because, as you say, they're irreplaceable and priceless. Um, because we're also part of a working museum and we retain really important objects, we also acquire. Yes. So we have to have a fund for acquisition as well as, as protection and conservation. So that money was ring-fenced for that and we've had to really carefully examine that and we're by no means at the end of that process because of course the Macintosh uh, uh, rebuild uh, has been interrupted but there is nothing to hide all of that is in the public domain and in fact the budget for that was also in the public domain if you're not clear with that with the appendices again I can easily provide you with that from the well I mean department. is there an easy link or something for because I mean it's, it seems bizarre that people are telling especially if someone is a director of the Bank Society is telling us they can't access li the list of what's been lost. And yep, no, it's, they're, they're it's, it's completely open, so it would be, be good to actually find out what that was. Sure. And, uh, what, what, could, and, yes, uh, could, could I just add to that, maybe just to yeah, come sure, back of course to, I. Uh, to your point, that that index was published, and according to the details that I have here, that that went online in 2014, but certainly was uh, published to the media mm -hmm. in 2015 because we had to detail the impact of the fire across our archives and collections. And following that, we provided the Museums Gallery of Scotland with details of the collection losses, uh, mm -hmm. just uh, coming back to your question, so that they could review if the Macintosh collection should retain its recognised status. And they confirmed that it still had that recognised status. And that has, that has all gone online. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the items are on the website. So we did publish that in full, and it was reported in the media. OK, well, thank you very much for that. Just one final point, uh, uh, convener, is just uh, in, in terms of items that are being replaced, is there any timescale whereby by which you're aiming to have such items replaced? Uh, we haven't yet uh, addressed that. I mean, uh -huh. it's uh, obviously 
on our list to do, but you, you'll understand we're in a <laughs> state of flux just now. Mm. We've got other priorities, but yes, we'll publish that as soon as we know. There's, I mean, can I just point out, there's nothing that is private or being kept from you at mm. all. Everything that we mm. know we make available. In fact, that's our remit to do so. And as I say, if there's anything missing, really happy to provide a paper to back that up. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Sorry, thank may you. I just add a, a short yes. comment, if, if I may? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, uh, we also continue to acquire for, uh, for our collection, mm -hmm. of course, and we are particularly keen on acquiring the brilliant work of our own graduating students mm -hmm. uh, who show the contemporary work that, that they're doing. And for example, I have acquired one or two pieces from our recent graduate on the 15th of June, as it happens, was our graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the Newbery Prize winner, Erin Macquarie whose brilliant work will be part of our archives and collections. So that's the kind of thing that we will keep on, keep on doing. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you. Convener, good morning uh, yeah. to the reps from Glasgow School of Art. Thank you for coming in. Um, yes, so you talked earlier about reconstruction. And I know that other members will want to focus on, on, on the future. But in, in terms of reconstruction, presumably that's dependent upon the existing buildings insurance policy paying out. So in that regard, will you make a copy of that insurance policy available to the committee? I said, no, you want it to be open and, and so forth. Um, I, I, yes, I think that's perfectly possible. Okay, yes, it's, again, it's, uh, it's publicly funded. That, that's great. Uh, who, who's the current buildings insurance policy with? You mentioned a previous insurer, but yes, I'm not sure if that's the same one as it's for... Not. It's, no, it's, it's not. It's, um, it's with the Lloyds list, Lloyd, effectively, okay. but it's Travellers is the name of the company. Okay. That we're doing. Um, and in terms of the actual um, approach of the insurance policy, these were questions I raised when we had uh, 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 Keir uh, and others in. Um, it was suggested that um, to us before we had our meeting with Keir that you know you would expect after a catastrophic fire that um, what you would be having in terms of a renewed insurance policy would be not simply a policy reflecting conditions uh, of a sort of statutory minimum uh, compliance, if you like, but sort of add-on conditions. Can you clarify whether your current buildings insurance policy adopts that approach of add-on conditions, so going beyond simply what minimum statutory requirements might have been in place. Um, can, can you be more specific about the add-ons? Well, I'm you asking you. I don't know. I've not seen the policy. We've not managed to get a copy of the policy yet, so I'm a bit of a disadvantage. Right. But uh, in terms of, of uh, normal uh, situations where you have a, a, a contractor going on site, um, I understand that there will be statutory minimum uh, requirements that the insurance policy must uh, embody. Mm -hmm. But one would have thought that after a catastrophic fire that there may well have been uh, a consideration as to what... Uh, supplementary add-on requirements might have been uh, part of the package such that you would be showing that you would be uh, using all your good offices to ensure uh, uh, you know that things were progressing in a reasonable fashion mm -hmm. yeah I think that's that's very much the case I wouldn't really describe it as add-ons but the insurance policy that we put in place was so robust at this time and uh, in fact I, I think uh, Liz negotiated with Keir as well about the, the, the compliance uh, when we handed that contract over so that would include what was within the insurance document. I'm very happy to provide that with you. I'm okay, sorry well, you that, asked for it and before. It's that's no really helpful all. and we'll look forward yep. to receiving that. I mean in terms of, of what may or may not be part of the requirements of insurance policy um, I, I note uh, from uh, various documents that um, in fact uh, after the first catastrophic fire and before the second catastrophic fire there were various visits that you seemed to arrange. There was a whole host of people potentially milling about the site, uh, events organised, individual visits. Uh, can you clarify yeah, exactly yeah, what I'd was love going to on? Clarify. Because can I just say in that regard? Yes, because sure. When I spoke to to ask here specifically about the the position of who was on site. So, you know, there was obviously Keir and its, and its workforce. Then there were the specialist uh, conservators and, and craftsmen and so forth. But Keir was at pains to stress that there was only very few of those uh, and that they were, in fact, subject to very stringent risk assessments and appropriate procedures. And, in fact, Keir had to authorise those people being in sight. So what about all these other visitors that were kind of... You know the act. Who was in charge of them? Who was supervising that activity? Well, well, thank you for that question. That's I'm, I'm delighted to answer that because the speculation in the press has been very skewed and wrong and incorrect. And and I, I, there was nobody milling round for a start. Um, 
The interest in the Macintosh building has been enormous and our connection with the local community and the wider uh, artistic and everybody else who's interested in the community. It's very important that throughout this process, just to we're only months away from opening this absolute jewel, that during the process, which in itself was interesting and part of many research projects, uh, that we wished people to have access to it. But again, I'm going to hand over to poor Liz to explain uh, the protocol for all those visits. Uh, they were so stringent, and I can tell you that because I, I was at one of them as a member of the Glasgow School of Art Choir when we sang uh, to raise money in the library. Uh, and it's the first time I've ever had to sing soprano in full hard hat, high vis and boots, which is uh, my excuse for being off key. But there was nobody allowed on site at all that did not go through the thorough vetting procedure and induction, absolutely not. The photographs that were in the press, for instance, um, they were showing people who had been through the process and were now in a safe area and were permitted to take off their hard hats. We followed this to the rule. I mean, Liz will, will talk you through can that. Just, okay, but can I just clarify? So presumably then there would be a, a register of all yes, of these visits and absolutely. individuals, there would be... So uh, everybody, yes. Every single person every that was single on that person, site. Yes. What about on the day of the fire, the mm. second catastrophic fire? Who was, who was milling around on that day? Milling around? Well, who was there? Who was on site on that uh, day? Well, Were there any of these visits, these individuals, these groups, these school children, these no, I, I, I'm art so, appreciators? I'm sorry, Missy, I do take issue with the milling around. There was no milling around on a construction site of such importance. Um, Everybody, as you see, was documented. All the visits. Was there somebody were there on the day? That's my question of the second cast or something. Well, it was the day of the graduation, so um, we would have to ask here that. I mean, we were all at the Butte Hall. There was no visits organised by the GSA on that day at all. No, so I'm sure you could. Uh, Kira would be able to answer you uh, as to whether there were any technical visits that day. But as far as the GSA is concerned, I can, I can yeah, yeah. For that, um, yeah. For that day, um, um, it was a Friday, so actually, technically, a lot of the contractors do stop work early on a Friday and I think we had um, the contractor itself would have finished probably about two or three o'clock that day there were no visits in fact there were no visits that week at all and it was one of the very rare occasions so we do remember it um, that we had said to a group they couldn't go around the building and that was on the Tuesday and it happened to be the Charles Rennie Macintosh Society um, who did think they were going in up until the point they arrived in the Reed building where we assembled people and at that point we'd spoken with the contractor and on that date He'd said, no, there's too much going on. They wanted to get into the library and we couldn't let them into that part of the building. There was too much physically going on. So we instead, um, Sarah McKinnon, my colleague, actually did a virtual tour of it. So at, at something like four o'clock that day, she went round and videoed the entire building and took it back. And we did a demonstration of what was going on on site uh, in the Reed building in, in a lecture theatre. That was on the Tuesday. That was the last public visit. Um, but I would average, you're quite correct, we probably had, we certainly had over 100 individual visits, probably far more. Some of those were institutions. Um, some of those would have been things like building control or historic environment Scotland. There were lectures, there were events occasionally, not often events, but it was actually written in our tender, so before Kia were even appointed, that one of the things we were absolutely committed to in the tender process was to... Um, demystify construction to bring people into the industry to talk about the traditional skills and to spread the awareness of this extraordinary building and it it was actually very much in furtherance of Scottish Government procurement that we wanted that in the process that we wanted through the Public Contract Scotland to actually engage through the Community Benefit Clause with a local community with a wider community with an educated interested community and we did have visits from America Japan and from people across the road. And where it was safe to do so, there was a very strict protocol and PPE and um, standards that had to be followed. Okay, well, that's uh, uh, duly noted. Um, in terms of the going back to the position, I'm just finishing, Camino, of the insurance policy, um, presumably, you know, there was no, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the actual conditions of insurance policy, all these events and visits and so forth were totally in compliance with the conditions and that they didn't vitiate in any way the conditions yes. of the insurance policy. Absolutely. And last question would be, um, I had understood uh, that um, after the catastrophic fire number one, that the GSA um, had only a very limited base on, on site and in fact moved out at some point in 2018 but I also understand that in fact the GSA occupied many parts of the building including the janitor's house the storage rooms Macintosh rooms and associated circulation spaces toilets and other accommodation GSA also used kettles 
and cooking facilities on the site, the television and AV equipment were used. Is that uh, accurate? Um, we had the janitor's flat, yes. Our office, there's four of us in the team, and we had the what was known as the janitor's flat, which was still part of the non-active Yes, but what about, site. sorry to interrupt, but the storage rooms, the Macintosh room, associated circulation spaces, toilets and other accommodation, kettles, cooking facilities, TV, AV equipment, um, all that? No, no, no. I mean, Is that we, not true, we, then? We, we were allowed to use the toilet, it's true. Um, no, well, I'm not, you know, but I'm... No, no the toilets were part of, not to be flippant at all, of course... Um, Within the site, as you came in the door, which was the accessible entrance, there was the Kia site office, which was the old shop of the GSA Enterprises. Beyond that, what was the old furniture gallery, which was the meeting room. And to the left-hand side, there was a janitor's flat. And there was toilets, which were within the Kia office. There was a small kitchen. Every appliance within that pad tested. Obviously, no toasters, anything that would create. But there was a kettle, for sure. But as part of their risk assessment of the site, as part of GSA's own risk assessment, every electrical appliance is pat tested, or, or portable appliance tested, um, so that there are no... And that was done on a monthly basis. So the kettle itself, it's not a problem having well, this on a Well, there's also cooking site. facilities as well? Or, no, or not? I think they brought in bacon rolls. Um, the, so you're saying there's no anything. cooking facilities on no, site on no, the part of no, GSA? No. Okay. In, in, in fact, can I just point out that the, uh, one of the events... Uh, one of the, I think one of the only catered There's events. A microwave. I'm sorry. There's on the microwave, microwave. Okay. right? Yeah. But only one of the catered events who had to be, in fact, cold food, and all the caterers had okay, to well be it's conducted. Just, it's been helpful that, to clarify there was actually a microwave on site. There, I, there was a microwave. microwave. Yes. Thank you very much, and thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Can I talk about your robust fire alarm system that you you talk about? Uh, the fire service tell us that there were dozens of false alarms that took place in the run up to the blaze in June. Uh, there was an average of three a week uh, in February, March, April and May, but there was none in the three weeks prior to the fire in June. On the night of the fire, there was no uh, indication from neighbours that they heard any fire alarms within the facility or within the area. So, to your knowledge, was the fire alarm ever disabled, dismantled or switched off during your time? Um, it, it would be turned off for uh, hot works uh, and that would be logged. Um, if you're working in a compartmentalised construction mm -hmm. site, that's standard practice. But that has to be, again, I'm <laughs> sorry, Liz, you're the expert on this, but um, that would be entirely logged. So as for the fire alarm not going off that day, we have no knowledge. Right. Nobody does until the SFRS. And, 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 and there were these number of false alarms There's that were occurring on a regular basis, as they three, on average, three a week. Yeah, are you meaning in the Macintosh or across the whole estate? In the, in the Macintosh. In the Macintosh. I think there were... A a few, but um, uh, that usually uh, that usually means that it's working. Robust. <laughs> so I probably haven't got much to add. I mean, no. certainly we were, um, as as you said, occupying the building up until mm -hmm. January of 2018, and there was a, a regular site test of that. There was a weekly mm -hmm. test of that fire alarm, uh, not an evacuation one. There were irregular ones where you had to evacuate the whole building, and there was certainly accidental tripping of that alarm by things like the plasters would have gone into an area and not informed the site agent on one occasion and dust got into one of the detectors that they hadn't capped or switched off. So it is common practice when you have... Not all construction sites would even have a hardwired uh, detection system anyway, but where they do, it is then implicit that you have to cover that alarm and not cause um, false activations, mm -hmm. obviously, to mm -hmm. the fire and rescue because that is troublesome. Um, so that was always engineered, always found out in advance if possible if those works were going ahead. Once or twice I know that didn't happen because I myself was evacuated from the building. Okay. And can I maybe go on to in talking about investigations after the fire? Uh, it's been reported on the 5th of November that the fire investigators were given access to the Macintosh building four months after the fire struck in June. Your submission talks about that there have been a number of site controllers in the intervening period. So who was responsible for ultimately authorising fire investigators to access the building? The Scottish Fire and Rescue have been with us from the start, obviously. Yep. They had the site themselves for the first week, and then after that it fell within the City Council's mm -hmm. safety cordon for the whole area. Um, we've had meetings with them. At first it was weekly and then off-site um, and latterly monthly, but we've been in almost weekly contact with them. They take decision as to when it's, it's safe for them to go on to that site. So our role um, as owner of the building uh, was to bring in a contractor, Rygart in this case, who have been steadily putting that building, yeah. well, making it safer. Yeah. 
Scottish Fire and Rescue visited on a few occasions, I know before the date they took access, but their own risk assessment has to say when they feel it's safe for them to go in. So they decided, um, after we demonstrated that a particular area in, in particular they wanted to access first was safe, our contractor was asked to make that area even safer by clearing a way through up to a certain point, and then they and Police Scotland went in at that point, but only after their own health and safety advisors had said it was okay under their own health and safety okay, regs to go through the building. Thank you, convener. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, Mayor convener, um, good morning, panel. Um, certainly, earlier on in your opening comments, uh, Dr Gray, uh, you, you said that uh, the GSA took every step possible uh, for the protection of the building and uh, maintained day-to-day -day, uh, job uh, oversight uh, of the building. Uh, now, the committee have received evidence that the, that the insulation uh, that was used was actually flammable. Now, why was combustible insulation uh, chosen over non-combustible uh, products in such a, a high-risk building? Liz. I need to sit in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a, the, the big flat roofs in the Macintosh building, the ones that fall over the, the main studios, um, were... Uh, were being insulated. So part of our commitment, again at the outset, before Keir were appointed, was in the tender to achieve the highest level possible with an A-listed building uh, of, of um, sustainability, of energy efficiency, etc. So that ranged from a whole range of things, from LED lighting to um, single glazing, a uh, single uh, slimline glazing on the studio windows. The roofs were one of the areas where we did decide to install not alter the profile, not alter the appearance of it, but to install rigid board insulation. And it was a PIR insulation that was used, which is perfectly um, legal, safe, uh, in when used in accordance with the manufacturer's um, instructions. It's still on sale. It's still the largest selling, I think, insulation that you would use for flat roof construction. And if you go to any um, roofing contractor or technical advice note, um, and this would be Historic Environment Scotland or Historic England, they would say that you would use a rigid board insulation on a rigid roof. Um, different in other areas, but where you have a flat roof, what you have to do is then obviously inspect that roof. So you have to have something that is a solid board. You can't put in um, the, the kind of thing you do is in loft, loft insulation. We did use rock wool, mineral wool, other areas. We use other measures and other circumstances, but on the flat roofs, as a rigid deck, you have to use a rigid material. So it is a, a PIR or a rigid board insulation system. Uh, but certainly, I mean, after the, the, the first fire, I mean, I would have thought that, uh, that any restoration works should have sought ways to ensure that any of the materials uh, that were going to be used uh, would have been uh, the best possible, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, particularly regarding the, the issue of the, the flammability of that particular product. The majority of the build we were actually putting back into that building was timber. Um, I mean, that's far more... Uh, flammable than, than, yeah, yeah, than this. But but on, on the issue of insulation. Though. On insulation, as I say, we were using a range of measures there. So we did have mineral wool where it was upstands or um, cavities, areas that we could we could use. Within the flat roof, that is what is the manufacturer's fact. There's nothing illegal about the use of this material in, in safe, in following the manufacturer's instructions, which is basically you don't allow oxygen into that space. Mm. So it has to be an encapsulated space. And in our case, we had we had an inverted deck roof. Uh, we uh, it had a mineral um, asphalt felt roof on top of it, which is in line with its original detailing by Macintosh, in fact, and that is a perfectly safe way to use that material. Okay. Uh, I've got a question just regarding the, some evidence that we received um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and just regarding the uh, the actual building. Uh, we were told that the at the time the principal contractor retained possession of the site. Now, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And in terms of the rooms that uh, that yourselves possessed on site, who retained the the possession of those rooms? The the entire site is under care as part of the contract. Right. So we were there by their leave, I guess. Okay. So if uh, if that been the case, then 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 how could the how could they actually have that full possession if you were actually utilising the rooms? How could they guarantee? That the, that the rooms that were being used were being done uh, to the highest possible standards, uh, particularly regarding fire safety? Um, we were subject to the same rules as anybody else coming onto the site. I mean, we didn't have to sign in every day. Um, we had to have a CSCS card, which is Construction Certification Safety Card, for, for access to the site. So my entire team have had that certification, which Kia had 
been very keen that we had um, to go around. We were inducted like anybody else. We had to sign in of a if we went beyond that point in the site. Um, so as you come in the door, there were rooms which were... It's like having a porter cabin within the Harris fence of a larger site. Um, but we were subject to exactly the same rules as anybody else other than that. And our rooms had to be pat-tested and any equipment in it pat-tested as well. So... Um, we were like any other, anybody else under the same control regime that Kia would have applied to, to anyone else coming in. No. Okay, okay, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning, panel. Um, it's, it's very clear that there's a lot of passion uh, uh, on the panel for uh, the School of Art, and that sort of leads me into looking ahead. I think we've spent a lot of time looking back at the what-ifs and the maybes, and I think that's very relevant, uh, and there are due processes which will have to be followed. But I also think it's important we have an open, frank conversation about what next, uh, both for Glasgow and, and the community. Um, I, I would like to kick off by just uh, uh, asking what the panel's views are on this. Uh, we've heard a real wide range and a, a very broad spectrum of ideas and, and opinions on this, everything from uh, comments such as it should be left as a ruin. Architectural ruins are among the most emotive objects in the world. It's a fair point from one witness to uh, others saying uh, there's no argument for why you wouldn't rebuild the school as it was. Uh, uh, and other uh, views who think that you can't rebuild the Mac because it won't bring back historic building. You'd just be getting something else. Uh, given that there is such a wide spectrum of views, do you have any personal views? And also, what what will be the process of deciding what happens next? Thanks. Probably let you go because I haven't um, spoken much. Starting in 2015, I was asked to uh, set up a project that would decide what would be happening in 2019 when we reopen the MAC. And I have in front of me the project proposal for that, which I called Transformation Design for the Future. And in it, I stated the Glasgow School of Art Macintosh building is in the heart of the campus, the heart of the city of Glasgow. And with that, we were making a clear statement that we are Glasgow's art school. And we're, of course, just known as the art school in Glasgow. Um, and we, made, uh, we set our intention to say the past would be revealed, revo uh, restored and intensified and would host a new form of creative practice that integrates, expands and makes public the work of the school. When we look at our position now, we would have been doing that if the Macintosh had opened in 2019 with our first year experience as we had planned. For the future, uh, we've had discussions already. Right after the fire, I gathered together a group of um, staff and started thinking about what the future could mean. The remit actually remains the same. The intent absolutely remains the same. And where we would expand it is that we want to be intensively much more collaborative with the local community, with the communities of Glasgow, and with all of the projects on which we already work. So our School of Simulation and Visualisation is looking at digital tools for school children. We do exchange projects and, and work in fine art with Cuba. We work with Garnet Hill Community and so on. I, the list is endless. We do a lot of live projects because that's the best way for students to learn about civic matters or industry and go out and start their own business, incidentally, in Glasgow. So we want to set up with our partners, and this is the discussion about how we're going to do this, a set of engagements which, where we can shape that future collectively. So I think we would answer that by saying, we are not saying it's going to be X or Y or Z, but collectively we can do the best for the art school that will also be the best for the city of Glasgow. And I think the chair can attest to some of those discussions having already started. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, thank you, Irene. It's the f I'm so happy you've brought up the future because that's what we're looking to just now. Um, you know that our formal view, uh, you've asked for a personal view, is the formal view is unanimous of the board and the management that we're bringing back the Macintosh as a working art school, as it always has been. Um, my personal view could not be stronger because I am lucky enough to have been a graduate who worked in that building. Um, and I don't think I could sleep at night if I was on watch when that ladder was pulled up behind me, where I saw that Macintosh building not coming back and having been given 
to future generations to enjoy that privilege that I took for granted at the time, but has changed my life out of all recognition, uh, which is uh, why I agreed to do this job, in fact. Um, going forward is about the most exciting thing at the moment I can think of, because we are in discussions just now closely with Glasgow City Council and the community about how we can have a front for the Glasgow School of Art on Sucky Hall Street, how we can spread out into the city and include everybody. Because although people who know we're there know we're there, uh, not everybody who comes to the city does. Um, so we have uh, a big state strategy plan, uh, which we're just putting together now, now that we've stabilised uh, uh, the school in terms of academic uh, teaching for, for the next term. And we'll be sharing that with everybody um, and inviting in everybody for consultation over that. Uh, because we recognise that as part of the creative industries, which is so essential to the economic health of Glasgow and Scotland, uh, we're a major part of that. And bringing back the Macintosh as a working art school uh, and giving that gift, passing that on, uh, is absolutely essential to us. You've probably had enough for me. <laughs> no. Very shortly. But I suppose in working on this building over the last four years, what we do know is Macintosh designed an art school. He didn't design a museum. He, he would have, I'm sure, if given the money at the time, like anyone else, a struggling architect, he'd have done the job asked. But he designed an art school and it worked brilliantly for 115 years. And we have a, we have a museum, we have Scotland Street. What I do want to say is that my discussions, and I'm not going to pretend I have extensive discussions with every single person in that incredible part of Glasgow. It's now part of an amazing regeneration initiative by the city. We're going to be part of that. Um, and the people I've spoken to, because this is an area filled with ex-students and people who teach or work or have lived there, are people who want that building back as an, as an art school and working for it. And the only thing out of something that you can, you can't really find a silver lining about what's happened here on this site. But this is going to be a major project for Glasgow and for the city. And what we do know from 214 is we have the skills in this country. We had to go a bit further afield or one or two, and we want not that to happen in the next phase. We want to bring it all back as tight to Scotland as we can. We have the crafts and the skills and the people who put their heart into that project. It was nine months away, and it was looking extraordinary. It would have been a wonderful place to have been this time in March. But um, we can do that again, and I think this will matter to Glasgow and to Scotland, this project. Can I add just to, 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 to um, Ms Ewing's point, is that in this next rebuild, um, having people come in uh, to this construction is going to be a major part of some of our research projects and involving people from the City College in Glasgow, apprenticeships and so on. So we're wanting to use this construction as part of the learning process. So, yes, I mean, we are, I, I, Liz is right, there's no silver line to it except the fact that we're, we're not beaten by this at all. We're enthused again to try and make the absolute best opportunity out of a disaster. GSA as, as managers have presided over, in their watch, two catastrophic fires. Why... Should anyone have confidence? It's not personal, but why should anyone have confidence uh, that um, that can be avoided well, in the future? Because it's you. not just once, with okay. respect. It is twice. Well, can, may, may I... I so, thank you very much for giving that opportunity to point out there are two entirely different incidents. One was an accident in a fully operational building in plain sight, which was evacuate, evacuated with procedures that were exemplary. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Report has uh, documented that thoroughly. And also, that gives me an opportunity as well, Kunir, to point out there's nothing redacted from that report, by the way, contrary to one of your witnesses saying that the only redaction was that of the individual involved in the fire. The second was a fire on a construction site in the possession of Keir, in a non-operational building. So the confidence you can have is in that intervening four years, the art school was managed perfectly well, competently, and I would say uh, rather magnificently given what we were about to deliver back to Glasgow. That's why they should have confidence. I suppose it's your definition of magnificence if there's a catastrophic fire that has seen the well, end of the building as we know it. Well, it is because so um, unless you have um, any proof to the... D unless you have proof, because we're here about facts, that it was mismanaged, we would be certainly very pleased to hear that. Well, as I say, you were in post and had the yes, duty and, as guardian um, of this building. Yes, and we were guardians, so building. do you have so any evidence to... Well, I, I'm saying that you were in post as guardian and there have been two catastrophic fires, so it begs the question... 
in terms of future structures going forward, perhaps it, has, as has been suggested, is maybe the best way forward is to uh, have the, the MAC separated out from the operational work of Glasgow School of Art. And maybe that has been suggested. Maybe that is something to consider. Uh, there are, there are a number of options and they'll all be considered. But I think uh, on, in defence of my management and my board, uh, over which I've been overseeing the last four years, they have been exemplary. And there's no evidence to the contrary. I would like to say that I, statement, if I may, from the point of view of the staff of the Glasgow School of Art, because we have been through a period from the 15th of June, and we're now at the 15th of November, to um, address the development of the Glasgow School of Art, and we have confidence in that board. So I'd just like to have that on record. I'm keen to make progress. Damien, are you finished your no, line of questioning now? Sorry. Um, if I... I appreciate we've, we've gone off on a tangent slightly and it was a fair, fair question from Ms Ewing, but could I can come back to the future again, which is my line of questioning. And, and with permission of the, the chair, uh, uh, one of my line of questions was around community engagement. I'd be very happy to pass it on to Sandra White, uh, who's a local representative, if, if that's OK. But if I could just ask one further question. I noticed in your initial response to my question around the future, I think there is a, a lot of unanimity I can see around bringing it back as a working art school, not just as a museum. Indeed, there's not much left to be a museum. It is it's, it's indeed a ruin. Um, and, and you talk about the next rebuild, and I think that's the phrase you use, but you clearly weren't specific around the nature of what that rebuild may or may not be. Uh, one of the witnesses we had said that this is probably one of the most well-documented architectural buildings in the world now as a result of the 2014 fire and subsequent uh, evidence that came forward to help with the, the, ne the, the, the last rebuild. You know, do, do you have any views as to whether you think we may see the building at least try to be rebuilt as it was being done before the 28th fire? Or is there any uh, uh, sympathy with the notion that, that, that there should be still a working art school uh, that is sympathetic to the work of Macintosh but not necessarily recreates what we were trying to recreate before the 2018 fire? Um, well, I can, I can answer that because um, obviously after the 2014 uh, disaster, we uh, had massive consultation because of course we're a creative uh, institution and wish to be creative. And so we put consultation out, not just locally and not just nationally, but internationally, even out to Venice and to, to the States to ask the architectural community uh, and everybody else uh, what they thought that should happen. Because there were there were a lot of voices saying perhaps McIntosh would have preferred you to build a new, brand new building. And we, and we took that on board and we discussed it at great length. And every avenue led us back to the idea that we had to just repair what had been damaged. Um, we haven't changed that view at all, uh, which is why we said that from the start, so that we could actually get on uh, with the, uh, the the intense complexities of even just what we're dealing with just now. But I'd really like to remind you that Macintosh designed this building. He didn't build it. Mm -hmm. Other people built it. So we have the original Macintosh plans as he drew them. So it is going to be a matter of not only joy to rebuild it from scratch. If you like. It might not be from scratch. These are early days. We might have some retaining. We don't know. It's incredibly it's in its infancy, that part of it. Uh, but our intention is to bring it back exactly as Macintosh designed it. Um, that will be unique as well because you must understand that over the years there's been all kinds of bits and pieces done to the Macintosh that have rendered it not in its original state. But now we know what exactly how he uh, designed it. Uh, what a thrill uh, for the people involved in that and again the community involved in that to, to do that from scratch. So that's rather exciting. So when we see rebuild, yes, we are envisaging uh, an absolute uh, your Macintosh building as he designed it. Can we move on to uh, Sandra White? Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning, and thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, obviously, we have to look to the future, uh, but as has been, you know, said before, 2014 fire, absolutely <coughs> tragedy. Uh, another one in 2018, absolutely unforgivable. And you mentioned the fact that you'd suffered uh, from the fires yourselves. The people who live in that community have suffered terribly, mm -hmm. not just in 2014, but even more so in 2018. Now, some are sitting behind us here in the audience. I have met them along with other elected representatives. Certainly when you talk about engaging with the community, that is not the message I certainly got across, got from the local community. And we have to understand that 
people have been out of their houses. They can't get insurance. Uh, businesses have closed down. They, they can't operate. And thankfully, Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government have put forward uh, some monies. So where I am really, really concerned is this absolute attitude where it's next rebuild. In fact, it's non-negotiable that this will be built. This new building, if it does get built, uh, it seems to be that yourselves as a board are saying it will be built. It's non-negotiable. It's going to cost nearly £100 million and it's going to take 10 years. Well, what of the local community who are suffering just now? Is there going to be consultation with them? Do they want it to be back there or do they want it somewhere else? So I, I would just like your thoughts on the local community, as far as I know, who have spoken to me in the meetings I've had, haven't been consulted, but it seems that it's in tablets of stone, if you pardon the pun, <laughs> that basically this will be built and it will be built there. Yep. So I, um, want, I want to know yeah, no, if there's no, other thanks. thoughts in regards to no. how the community feel about it. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Thank you, uh, Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, we have been in close contact with the community recently um, and... Uh, we had a very useful meeting at the council, in fact, recently uh, involving the residents and uh, the businesses. Uh, I think you're aware that we apologised for not having got out quickly enough to speak to them, but they were, I think they've accepted the reasons for that. Um, we're not going to move forward a, a single inch without consulting them. You're absolutely right. I really want people to understand... Um, what was Swite saying? There's people. It's not just their buildings. It's their health. It's the, some of them have gone bankrupt. They've lost businesses. They've lost mm -hmm. everything. Um, I really can't tell you the kind of suffering that some of the residents have I explained, and we are massively sympathetic to that. I'm an ex Garnet Hill resident myself. Many of our staff and our students are Garnet Hill residents. We are friends. Um, they've always been part of our community. We're horrified by what's happening to them, and it's a major part of our strategy to involve them. So uh, there would be no point in carrying on if they weren't part of this plan. We have got all kinds uh, of ideas for liaisons, for committees, of inviting them in, of using their skills, of asking their opinion. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Mary. I hope yeah. you don't mind. No, no, not but, at all. But basically, when you're saying that, the point I'm trying to make is perhaps a local community, a number of them anyway, one, don't want it rebuilt oh, in the absolutely. way it is. Well, so I think they need to be asked. And two, I'm really following up from something that Annabel Ewan uh, said as well, and it came from Tom Inns and Professor Tony Jones as well, to say that basically a, a building trust should be there that should oversee yeah. and the board should not be in yeah. charge of With the whole... You know, yeah, so no, we're, 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 we're aware of it. has been brought forward. We're aware, we're aware well. of those. The, so what, those what's your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, no, we're aware well, of those two, two opinions, which are minority opinions, but we will certainly take those views on board because we're, as I say, in our infancy in deciding uh, how we move forward. Um, and we will we'll look at every option. Um, our view currently is you know, right. one that we're... You know, we're the best people placed to do it. We're the, the experts. Um, uh, we're the ones that are uh, can liaise with the local community. But um, don't think for a minute that I haven't taken on board everything you've said. We, we're completely with you on that. Um, and yes, just yes. Okay, so I can I can go to some of the communities behind us here and others and and say to them you will be consulted. There'll be plenty of consultation on whether this actually does get rebuilt. Ah, no, I, uh, this is the point I'm trying right, to no, say. I'm, Ten I, years they're going to have to no, suffer. I'm to... No, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, we will consult them about how this is done. But our remit is but to, re, to, to rebuild it. There has to be negotiation. I mean, no, well, I'm, I'm afraid public, that's, that. Sorry, it's public well, money that's being used. But our, but our it's not the board that public says what remit happens. is to is to to deliver education, and that will be up to the. The board the elsewhere, if that's the well, we'll discuss the it, but they'll be consulted. Well, I'm sorry, I, I don't, sorry, Chair, I don't think I can accept the fact that a trust which is paid through public money is dictating to a whole community or anyone else. So, would you say, for instance, the Glasgow University campus development would have to be given permission of the local residents? Say? I think they've consulted fairly highly mm. with the local residents. Well, that's there. what we'll be doing and too. I, but that's sorry, Liz, I'm saying. sorry. I'm I think we need to move on. Mm. I'm sorry. Then. I think I'll keep Could continue this. Point, yeah. I'll yes. continue um, the conversation. Just insofar as we are engaged, I, I, you can't do enough community consultation. I totally accept your point. But in the first project, we were working with the local community in terms of the Bread Devon and Garnet Hill Park, which was an entirely 
uh, our project. I mean, I've been there, sorry to, to interrupt. I know the this stuff that goes on in the community. The point I cannot accept is that a board, which is paid by public money, is dictating the fact that well, we no, are going to spend £100 board, million pounds me, and take time. Can I just say the board is not well, I remunerated? I think we shall, I think we shall uh, move on. But I will speak to you. I, I would I like, think I'd like to move on now. I would just like to ask a supplementary to that myself, actually. You mentioned minority opinion. Um, Professor Innes, obviously, is a former director, and I, I think uh, uh, Professor Jones is a former director as well. Um, they've both expressed the view that the art school board shouldn't be in charge of any rebuild. So that's two former directors. So that doesn't, it might be a minority opinion, but it's certainly a very um, significant one. And I think that the point that, um, that ha has been made by Professor Inns is that um, this uh, capital expenditure project of a, a hundred, uh, a hundred um, million pounds is far in excess of your turnover. I think your turnover is about 37 million a year, um, so £100 million is far in excess of that. And in his view, it will be detrimental to your work as an art school um, to have to take that on again. Would you care to briefly comment on that? Yes, uh, uh, not at all. Um, I, I completely respect um, Professor Inns' personal opinion, which is his to express. Um, I disagree. Uh, we do know that um, when we uh, appoint a new director, it will be a really exceptional person who will be able to manage both projects and oversee them by the proper delegation of, of being able to bring in the experts who are uh, absolutely placed to be able to oversee such an important thing as we did uh, with the 2014 FAR very successfully. And it is a big ask, um, and that's what we'll be looking for, but we have no doubt whatsoever that we have the capability of doing that at all. If I might add just mm. to, uh, a comment on this, um, it's absolutely the role of every higher education institution to take care of their estate mm. matters places where I've worked before. We all have to do that now. It's not just about doing the education. We have to maintain the infrastructure, yes. of course, as best as we can. And this is our response to that. But over and above all of that, just like from 2014 to now, the restoration is a research pro project. We have PhD students studying that research. They are, do they are doing work on it. We have creative practice based on it. It's not a project that can be hived away somewhere else as if it's nothing to do with us and our educational function. It will be absolutely embedded in our future. We will learn from that. We will bring the craft teaching into our teaching programs, etc. That has to be an integrated program. And it's for that reason that it becomes very interesting for the Glasgow School of Art, for Glasgow and nationally and internationally, to be doing this project at all. Thank you. How can the 2014 uh, team have been successful when the building burned down? Okay. I'll explain that again. These were two separate Incidents. But it wouldn't. The, this, the the building would not have been a construction site if it hadn't been for the first fire. So therefore, they're not separate. They are entirely separate, convener. Um, as you know, the SFRS uh, report on the 2014 fire is very explicit. What happened? I'll go over it with you. We well, don't need to like. go over it again. Okay. But I, I'll in that case, we know what the accident uh, was in 2014, and none of us know what happened in June fire, but it was on a construction site and it was entirely different. The efficacy of the management and the board in the intervening four years has been exemplary. Okay. Polly McNeill. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, I'm glad that you did acknowledge in answer to Sandra White the devastation to the residents and the businesses. Um, and my own view is that it will be a long time before it will recover. So the decisions that you take, I hope you appreciate, will impact on Glasgow's future. I have to say that uh, I, I think you are deluding yourselves if you think that you have a good relationship with this community. And... Um, well, people are shaking their heads in disagreement Excuse behind me, um, you. Excuse Pauline, if slide. I could just say to people in the gallery, please don't enter, um, please don't say anything that would could disrupt the meeting. Thank you. And it's one of the things that the fire has exposed is that we have this wonderful institution in Garnet Hill, as you say, but it has exposed your feelings over the last number of years to involve this community. Now, so it's not maybe the business of this committee as to what the future of the art school is, but it is the business of local politicians if you're going to spread the estate to Sucky Hall Street. 
Now, the fact that I'm going to have to ask you these questions, I'd hope you would take as an indication that you're still not properly informing the community of your plans. And I would plead with you on this. If you want to rebuild your relationship with this community, you really start need to start telling them immediately what your plans are. I do have some questions about the fire investigation, but maybe you could just tell the committee, first of all, um, which buildings then do you intend to spread out into in Sucky Hall Street to create this frontage? I have no idea yet, and I, and I absolutely agree with you 100%. We can't take that estate strategy forward at all without, as you say, repairing any damage that the, some of the residents or some of the businesses might feel has been done. Not all of them, can I say. Um, I'm 100% in agreement with you. And that estate strategy will be done completely completely in partnership with, if it happens at all, and we're still discussing it, with Glasgow City Council, with all the residents, with all the businesses and all involved parties. You are right, you cannot move forward without communication and community and business involvement. So, so yes. So have for retrospective planning permission for one, one of the buildings in Sucky Hall Street, for example? Well, that's what we believe. Uh, I, I can't that answer that. Correct? I'm not sure. I'd have to check that out, but I, I'm not oh, sure. Sorry, this will be Breckenridge, is it? Oh, Breckenridge. Sorry, that I was about decant. Sorry, that was okay. about student decant. That wasn't about future right, so state that's strategy. That's temporary. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, could I ask you about the fire investigation? Mm -hmm. um, it was a shock to a lot of people mm. that it's only just started. Now, I'm sure you understand that the businesses and the residents are anxious to find out the cause of the fire because they will have questions and there'll be liabilities issues and we don't know who yeah. was responsible. You said earlier that it was accidental. So I wondered how... You sorry, with the 2014... Fire. You were talking about 2014. Yeah, 20, sorry, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. so with the 2016 fire we don't know much oh, yeah. about. But do you think that the fire investigation is now compromised by your decision to protect and rebuild the Glasgow School of Art, uh, the, the, the Macintosh building. So to leave people like me, um, when I heard this, I thought, how can we get to the bottom of what caused the fire if the fire investigation team have only just been granted access? Mm -hmm. Now, I have written to the fire service. I haven't had the reply yet, but I just wondered what you were able to say about why such a long delay, and are you not concerned? Yeah. That this delay means that we might not get to the bottom of what caused the fire in 2018? Oh, massively agree with you. Um, the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have been hampered, obviously, by uh, just straightforward building control regulations. It's about safety. Um, I hope, I mean, we have spoken to residents and businesses at some length to try and explain to them that we were focused on trying to get the cordon lifted and uh, uh, shortened to get them back into their homes. While, while we were not communicating with them, and you're right, we didn't do that. That was a failure of communication. That's because we were working hard on the actual uh, the actual process of trying to get them back into the houses. Um, yes, it's the most frustrating thing I can think of. I met with a, with a few residents um, just last week who were asking me exactly the same thing, and I don't know. Uh, we are desperate to find out the cause of this fire. Um, we can't interfere with the SFRS investigation. And I understand Police Scotland as well still have, I think, about 70 interviews still to do because they can't do that part until the SFRS have got them. It's a, it's a huge investigation, but there's yeah. nothing we can do to speed that up, and we haven't hampered it. Just for clarification, that investigation yeah. has been ongoing, as I know, from day one, because yeah. Police Scotland have been doing right. the interviews checking CCTV footage, everything they could do outside the site, they and I think SFRS have been working hand in glove on that, so we're not privy to obviously that, but SFRS itself would only take access once it was safe to do so, it was their choice, we don't grant permission obviously, building control have a role in this at the city, but it, I think it was their own health and safety and they have to put that ahead of everything else, not the school, not anyone else. J just for clarification, um, I'm not suggesting that, but I th you yes. did they take a decision to down take it and preserve it and rebuild it and I was taking from that that's not initially what we were told we were told something else but your decision to do that means that that was obviously going to delay well, we if you demolish the building for example you would have got in right away and made it safe. Didn't, that wasn't an option given the the, the nature of the what a great I, deal to do is in our discussions trying to preserve with, it. I mean, with so you have to be honest about yeah. that. We're, if we had demolished and cleared the site, there would be no evidence. No. Um, I think, you know, to send in a bulldozer, however long that would have taken, and mm. our, our advice from our engineers and from the contractors, 
and working with the city's building control was at an uncontrolled demolition there because it sat on such a steep site over right. two other commercial properties and Suckley Hall Street. Um, hence the cordon being as large as it was. Would it have been an uncontrolled de demolition? We don't know how long that would have taken, but it would certainly have destroyed any evidence. As it is, they've been able to actually piece their way into that building and pick out for it. So the forensic teams have been in, and it's been absolutely in accordance to... You know, they do call the shots, the Police Scotland and SFRS on that, so we would be guided by them on how they wish to access the site. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. I just wanted to clear up a couple of other issues that were raised in um, our previous evidence sessions. Uh, one is the fact that uh, your contractor, and you, you have addressed this in your rebuttal, your contractor, Keir, um, was... Uh, criticised um, by Professor John Cole for its work on the uh, Dumfries and Galloway Leisure Centre, uh, DG1, uh, and in particular, Professor Cole criticised the fire-stopping measures on that building. Now, in, uh, you've addressed that in your rebuttal, and you've said at the time of appointment, Glasgow School of Art followed the rigorous procurement process, uh, and the issues relating uh, from the uh, DG1 were not known, but these were reported by the BBC on the 25th of February uh, 2015. Uh, it was known that, uh, that the building had closed and the local authority was seeking compensation. Um, Gordon Gibb, who works in your own Department of uh, Architecture, um, has criticised you for this and said that any due diligence would have uncovered uh, this dispute was widely known in the construction community before you appointed Keir. Uh, thank you very much, Kavira. Um, uh, Gordon Gibb is, is entirely wrong uh, on that and many other aspects, but I'll pass it over to Liz to explain what we knew about that. Um, insofar as I was handling the procurement at that time and the writing of the brief for advert to the, to the building community for this project, and as you know, Keir uh, won through. If there'd been any serious... Um, negligence and something as critical as that it would have come up in the pre-qualification and they would have simply not been able to even to proceed through the tender process as it was you're correct I think I don't know what date 215 or whatever the BBC report was and much as we all believe everything uh, in the press the actual report didn't come out I think till 217 and that was John Cole's evidence that also looked at the Edinburgh schools so when the evidence came out in 2017, we did speak to Keir about that at the time. They were very clear that it was a different division of their company. That may just be names, I don't know, but it was a different division of the country. But far more critically for us, it was under a design and build contract. We were under a standard JCT contract, which meant critically that you actually have full supervision and your oversight of the project as it goes along. In a design and build, the contractor takes the risk, but also the, the profit, if it comes through, uh, of delivering that project within a budget, within a programme. But quality is not going to be uppermost. So it's actually a very fine way of proceeding if you're building a gym hall and it's a new build on a new site, but not for a project like the Macintosh. We went through a standard building contract here. And I did take the trouble, and I'm not going to look at my notes at all, but this is the one place I will, to look at the John Cole report um, and what he, he did say, and it's just two sentences, is that the presence of so many defects in evidence of the fundamental fail were down to the fundamental failures of quality control used by the main contractor, in this case, and the design and build supply chain, delivering the design, construction, supervision and inspection of the building. The lack of independent professional scrutiny of an on-site constructor uh, on uh, construction professionals on behalf of the client. We had all of those professionals in place because it was a standard contract where we certified and looked at those works before they got paid. Mm -hmm. it, was a it was a daily process of watching what Kia did. Well, not watching, but collaborating. It was a collaborative project, and they were running a very fine project. Right. So were any of the professionals in your team that were supervising them expert in fire prevention? We had Atelier 10, who were fire engineers. They were the, they were the uh, fire engineering part of the team. OK, thanks very much. Just to finish off, to go back to sort of my original point, uh, since your federal report in 2006-2008, um, the, the building was left, it wasn't fire stopped, and we didn't have a suppression system in. And all that time, it was being used for the education of young people. Um, apart from after the 2014 fire, of course. Um, you've said on a number of occasions that you're confident the building was safe. Mm -hmm. you, you, you stand by that? Absolutely, yes. Right. It's just because in the, I've got the federal report in front of mm -hmm. me here. 
uh, and the assessment is, and there's um, six different issues, likelihood uh, of a fire occurring in the building, medium to high risk, potential for fire to remain undetected, medium to high risk, potential for fire to grow, spread beyond item first ignited, high risk, potential for fire to grow beyond room of origin, high risk, hazard posed by fire, high risk, consequences in the event of the fire spreading, high that was in 2006, mm -hmm. and the two things that would have um, addressed that, which would be fire stopping and fire suppression, didn't happen. How can you sit here and insist the building was safe? Um, well, again, we're talking about 2006, and I think we answered that earlier uh, that we'd what, the previous. But you didn't take any. You, you didn't put any measures in place in response to that report, which you commissioned. You didn't put any, you didn't put fire suppression measures, you tried to, and we talked through that, and you, you explained why you didn't put fire stopping in mm -hmm. place. But those two significant uh, preventative um, measures were, were not taken. So despite the fact that what I've just read out in terms of the risk, and you're still insisting the building was safe. Yes, it was deemed to be safe. It passed, it passed every regulatory test. And we've explained earlier about uh, putting in the enhancement of the fire suppression system. I think we dealt with that earlier. But it, it wasn't, there was no fire suppression system in at the time of either fire. No, but, I, well, I'll explain to you again about the fire suppression system Well, you don't need again. to explain. You explained that before. Yeah. I'm just making the point that you're saying the building was safe, and I've just read out your own report, mm. which says on six different areas that the, the building was uh, high risk. Yeah, OK. OK. All I want to say is if it hadn't been a safe building, we would not have been allowed by the laws of this land to have put 500 students in it and thousands of people to run through it. So like any other historic building, it had issues that we as good custodians were asking the questions about and are probably one of the only institutions that were going to the extent of doing this and then putting in all the measures, CCTV, a, a low-pressure mist system, VESDAS, But you detection. didn't put the low-pressure mist system in. It wasn't in. We were putting it... I think, you know, the Parliament decided to build another crossing of, of Scotland of the fourth bridge, what, in 2007? But if I'd have rolled up there in 2008, I, I'd have got wet. It's, it's, it has to be built. It has to be designed. It has to be fundraised. It has to be passed all the listed building consent. It was an extraordinarily bespoke system. It wasn't a kit of parts. It was something that, and the main part of that in the timeline was to actually raise the funds for it, because there are no public funds for putting in a half million pound, or in the case of actually the system we were putting in, over a million pounds worth of mis-suppression into that building. Yeah, it and it, it was your available. choice to pursue mis-suppression, and as others have yes. raised with you, you were also spending millions of pounds extending your campus uh, at that time. And again, I think that's, an, uh, that's something that people find difficult to understand, that this building was left in this state at a time when you spent £50 million on uh, extending your campus and then even after the 2014 fire embarked on another campus extension by purchasing uh, the Stowe building and that despite all this money being spent on uh, extending the campus which and the purpose of that is to increase the number of students of course and increase your income that uh, this building was left unprotected. Well, I need to stop you there, actually, Kavira. It's yeah, not yeah. to increase our income, because, as you know, our income is pretty much set by you know, the Scottish Government in terms of the places that we have and the international students that we can attract. That's, that's any extra income. We purchased still because of the decant of the fine arts students uh, to the Tontine building. It was one of the best pieces of happenstance ever. That's the most beautiful building, and it will come into the Glasgow School of Art estate as an absolute jewel in the crown. I think if anyone expressed surprise that we were upgrading, uh, enhancing and improving our estate for our core remit, which is the creative education of students in Scotland, uh, I, that would make me raise my eyebrows. Why would that be a bad thing? We were doing that in conjunction with preserving, enhancing, improving and making safe the Macintosh building. I see no dichotomy there at all. I see. Could I just, sorry, could I just add a point when you mentioned extending the estate. I think you're possibly referring to the Reed Building, but the Reed Building, I was head of design, the School of Design at that point, and we occupied the Newbury Tower and the Fowlis Building, which were deemed unfit for purpose and had to be replaced. It wasn't an extension to our campus, it was actually on the same mm -hmm. site yeah, so as the previous yeah. buildings. And they, that, they, that's why okay, it was built. so they, they were replaced, but as I've just read out your own report, where the Macintosh was high risk in a whole number of areas in terms of fire, and all this other activity was going on, 
but that has not been addressed. It might have been intention to address it, but you're talking about a 20-year period in which it wasn't addressed. Well, quite clearly it was addressed because that became you know, a major part of the agenda when the refurbishment was happening before prior to the 2014 farm. We discussed that at great length about uh, applying for and raising the funds to do just that. But as Professor McCarroll McWilliam has pointed out, that was not an expansion. We were merely taking down buildings that were no longer fit for purpose and replacing them, uh, funded by the Scottish Funding Council brilliantly, with an absolute state-of-the-art, wonderful building for the future education of Scottish and international students. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any regrets at all in, in terms of decisions you've made? Would you have done anything differently and do you take any responsibility? Uh, oh, we take full responsibility at all times for what happens uh, at the, the GSA, 100%. Um, yes, I have massive regrets that we've suffered two major disasters. In fact, I'd say more than regretful, it's broken my heart. Um, we have, as I said, audited uh, ourselves in precisely the same way as this committee rightfully has. There's no question, really, that you've asked, that we haven't asked ourselves a 100 times. We keep asking ourselves, could we have done this better? Is there something we missed? Is there a lesson that we've learned from that that we can take forward? So we are very self-critical and will continue to, to do so. Um, I don't have any regrets about the process. Um, I have massive, you know, massive regrets that these things happened. Um, but no, I can't in all conscience say there's something that I would have done differently. I, mean, I don't know how you feel. I feel exactly the same. And the intention to fully couple, as was the original intent, the building with the educational system of the Glasgow School of Art just remains what we've always been doing for 100 years and for the next 100 years. Yes. So that's really our core purpose and intent. Um, I do regret, that is a point, I do regret actually not having engaged more fully yeah. and sooner with the, the local community. And... Uh, I, I really do, because that was actually a communications mistake. And it wasn't intentional. But, and the perception that they had is valid, because even if we didn't intend it, if that's how they felt, that's valid. So, yes, that is the one thing I do regret. Was but nothing communications. before the fire, no decisions made before no, the fire? I, no, I, I, I'm not, because, again, we have really gone over this over and over and over again, and, um, and we'll continue to do so. So we are very self-examining. Thank you very much for coming to give no, evidence Thank you for today. the invitation. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank we you. We shall now suspend uh, the meeting and go into private session. Thank you.